I'm missing others, but we're glad you're here. Um, some time ago, now, a few weeks ago, with some interruptions, we began a series on the leaders in a local church. And um, we did that uh, in response to a request for the subject, and I certainly uh, appreciate the suggestion. I think it's something we have talked about through the years. Um, it's not an effort to try to ramrod anything. It's more an effort to, again, study an essential and important subject and to recognize the fact that uh, it is possible to be scripturally unorganized. <laughs> but no church will be all it needs to be until it's scripturally organized. And um, so with that in mind, it's good to go back and look at the passages. And this is a new series for me. Somebody asked me, when was I going to deal with this particular question? And I said, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, I'm sort of working this as I go. And I have an idea in mind of where I want to get to. Uh, but uh, this is, um, I'm dealing with the same passages that have always been there, of course, but I'm waving my hand at a different place. Anyway, this is a different series. And so uh, we really have tried to, to organize this around the terms that are used in Acts 20 and in verse 28, where Paul met with the elders of the church at Ephesus, the presbyteros, and he said, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. And what you find, of course, in this verse are three different terms that all relate to the same function, but they are different words, and they describe different aspects of this picture. Uh, some of them describe the man, and some of them describe his work. But we began by looking at this last term about uh, poimen, about being a shepherd and feeding, shepherding the flock of God. We concluded those thoughts this morning, and I'd like next to take up this word episkopos and to talk about uh, what is normally in the old King James translated by the word bishop. What is a bishop? What does it mean to be a bishop? Well, that's an interesting question because there certainly are different ideas about that. Sadly, I think through the years, the word bishop has uh, come to take on a very different meaning. A lot of times when people hear the word bishop, they think about some character that looks like this uh, or dressed in slightly modernized garb. Uh, but uh, he's uh, somebody with a crown on his head sitting in a chair somewhere, a throne, giving out dictates. Uh, but I don't think that that's the, the Bible picture or, of Episcopos, nor is it the picture that we ought to have in the, uh, in the Lord's church. The word bishop, the English word, if you just look it up in a good English dictionary, uh, will be defined more in line with that first picture. The senior member of the Christian clergy, typically in charge of a diocese and empowered to confirm holy orders. It's one of those definitions that you have to look up other words in the definition to try to understand what they're talking about. If you're a Bible student, you don't know anything about holy orders or a diocese, but a diocese is just sort of an area over which a bishop rules, and holy orders, I think, comes back basically to the ability to confer office to others or to confer to them what they call uh, the sacraments. Anyway, a bishop then is an official somebody who sits in a, a place and rules over a large area. Um, an archbishop rules over even a larger area. So there are bishops and archbishops, in the Catholic Church, even the archbishop's not the big dog, of course. You have over him cardinals and then ultimately the pope at the top of that list. And Protestant churches have adopted that same kind of idea. Um, whereas you have uh, those who are, it's hard to, hard to read from this angle anymore. Uh, anyway, you have bishops presiding uh, over uh, these various segments that are far above the local church. Um, they uh, rule over a much larger area. Uh, talking about our Catholic friends, um, you might find it interesting, I don't know, that um, there is a, a bishop who rules over this area. Uh, all the Catholics would answer to him ultimately uh, in fact, not just Bibb County and Jefferson County, but I think it's some, was it 38 counties? 39 counties 
according to their website. The Diocese of North Alabama incorporates all of these from, uh, this be Marengo County, I think, down here uh, around Montgomery, all the way up to Lauderdale County and Colbert and so on. So uh, the website said there are 56 parishes. In other words, you'd have to look up somewhere besides the Bible. But I think it's generally associated with a local church, as, as we might understand it. And uh, so they're just scores of these churches. And, and not just churches, but uh, all kinds of institutions, whether it be hospitals or um, schools or various other things. And they're all ruled by a fellow whose uh, house is this place right here. That's not a house, really. It's uh, what's called so-called St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, when I had that little part-time job with the Birmingham News, I used to work right across the street this place and uh, ventured in there a time or two. It's quite an impressive building. But it's the only cathedral in the state of Alabama, I hear. I understand that's right. And, uh, and this is where the bishop rules over all of these Catholics, over all this territory. They even had it in, the, uh, in their literature. 28,092 square miles. One guy. Now, I don't mean to say he doesn't have helpers. But one bishop over all these counties. And I don't know how many thousand people. Um, you know, you might ask the question with me. When people think about a bishop, this is what they think about. Where in the world did this come from? It didn't come from the Bible. No, it didn't. It didn't come from the Bible. But I think its history can be pretty well traced. Now, this book is uh, not a book written by members of the church or religious people, as far as I know. It's a book on uh, Western civilization. Uh, it's written by three fellows, uh, Wallbank, Taylor, and Bailkey. And uh, they have a section where they talk about this very question. Uh, in this particular uh, book, they write, The Development of Church Offices. At first, there was little or no distinction between laity and clergy. This system soon proved quite inadequate. At first, the officials were called elders or presbyters. They were also referred to as bishops or overseers. That sounds familiar. By the second century, the offices of bishop and presbyter had become distinct. Now that's the first change, and, and more than just these folks make that point. When people look back on religious history, they talk about one of the key moments being when people began to no longer have a group of elders, presbyters, shepherds, all the same thing, all the same. They began to make a distinction, and maybe they'd have a chief fella among this group here. The bishop now had the right to enforce obedience from his presbyters, and from other subordinates. New churches organized in the country adjacent to the mother church, which was usually located in the city, were administered by the presbyters responsible to the bishop. Another change that uh, crept in was that not only do we have a chief man among the elders, but now we have chief churches among the churches. And now the big city church, they got the money, maybe they've got more educated folks, and so they now are going to be chief, and uh, these country churches will look to them, you know. If they have shepherds, well, they'll always consult with and answer and obey the big city boss. Um, thus, an administrative division evolved called a diocese under the jurisdiction of a bishop. That's where it came from. He goes on to say, the office of bishop was most important in the church. The bishop had charge of all church property in his diocese and was the official interpreter of Christian dogma. In the evolution of an organized hierarchy, the church was indebted to the Roman government models. When he says Roman government, he means the Roman Empire. And uh, folks have made this point through the years. You look at a parallel between the Roman Empire and its bureaucracy and the Catholic bureaucracy, and there are certainly striking similarities. In building their organization, the Christian officials, this is his language, of course, but the Christian officials took over the administrative divisions of the Roman Empire and borrowed much of its law. Gradually, the bishop at Rome was recognized as the leader of the church and assumed the title 
of the Pope. So it's, it's quite a story. But uh, the one thing that's clear, and I don't think it can be de de uh, debated by anybody, this arrangement sure didn't come from the scriptures. The road to the Roman Catholic Church was uh, something that uh, you can trace. I read an article, it must have been 30 years ago now, by Sewell Hall, and he wrote an article on this very subject, and he called it The Road to Rome. And he talked about in this article the steps of apostasy. And these are some of the points that he made. In the first place, he said, you know, when you look at this process, one thing you notice is the steps were small. They may not be small to you and I, but you've got to remember that when these folks started out, and they just said, well, look, now, old, we got uh, three elders here, but old brother so-and-so, well, he knows more than the rest of us, so he'll be the chief, and we'll just follow what he said. That didn't seem like such a big deal. You think those folks had any idea where that would eventually lead to? The changing of the structure of the scriptures? An eldership has got to work as a body, as a whole. They've got to communicate together, and they've got to, to work in unison. Uh, they've got to come together over their differences, but they work as a body. You cannot have one man ruling over an eldership, whether it's two men, five men, 20 men. But it seemed like such a small thing. In the second place, you know, the steps seem so logical. I mean, after all, doesn't it make sense? Uh, so and so is more, uh, maybe he's got more gifts than this fellow does, or the rest of us do. Why don't we just let him do that? Seems logical. Or, or doesn't it make sense that this big city church over here, they've got the money and they've got a lot of advantages, and so they'll just oversee these churches out in the country? I mean, that's just, that just common sense. Um, tell you something else. He said, and, and, and from the world's point of view, these steps were successful. And what I mean by that is that when you look at the church that came out of these changes, they were somebody. <laughs> they were big time. Their organization had made them uh, a political power. You don't read about your brethren in the history books like you read these folks in the history books. <laughs> these folks went somewhere. They started telling princes what to do. And so from the world's point of view, this was a success. And coupled with that, these steps involved uh, always creating chief seats for the vanity of men. There's a big difference. Let's say um, uh, I wanted to talk to the governor of Alabama on the phone, get her straight about something, or just ask her a question, whatever it might be. Uh, you imagine how that phone call would go. I'd call down to her office, and I'd, I don't know if this would work this way or not, but it, it likely would work something like this. They would say, well, now, who are you? Uh, what do you do? I said, well, I, I, I'm a Bible teacher. Uh, what, where, where are you from? What are you? I'm a Christian. Uh, okay. Well, she's busy. <laughs> uh, call back never. But suppose I could say this. I could call up and I, they'd say, well, now, who are you? I am the archbishop of all the churches in Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. And I have about 7,000 people who answer to me every day. You know, I might get her on the phone. Maybe I'd have to call her back, but I probably would get a call back because I'd be somebody then. I wouldn't be just a nobody. And, and, and by the way, you know this, I uh, trust as well as I do. This kind of problem is a problem among our, the history of our brethren. Not just going way back to the early 2nd century and 3rd century. But in the 20th century, we saw the church get involved in all kinds of human organizations that set up chief seats. I am the president of the United Christian Missionary Society. I am the president of some college or the president of some uh, other type of benevolent organization. And... Uh, 
oh yeah, this has always been a problem. And it certainly was when it was first begun. I think one thing that's obvious is that these steps, even if they were well-intentioned, were certainly steps that moved away from divine authority. Where's the scripture for this kind of arrangement? Where's the scripture for having one man rule over a church? Where's the scripture for having one church rule over one more church, much less 20 or 50 or whatever it might be, or 39 or whatever it is? Where's the authority for that? And that's the problem. And that's what was missing. And that's the question that failed to be asked. We've said this before, you know, it's like one fellow, he was asked about something he was trying to get the church involved in, or did had to get the church where he was involved in, and somebody was asking him about it and said, where's the scripture for what you're doing? And his response was uh, honest and horrifying. He said, I didn't say it was scriptural, I just said it worked. Well, again, better ask the boss about that. He might be the one to decide whether it's working or not. Maybe you think it's working. But it may not be working according to him because he has all authority and all power. And let me mention to this point, one other point that he made, and this is a point that's been made many times, and rightly so. I tell you, all this was predicted. If you go back to the scriptures, I think we can see a precursor. Look over it. Let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, the apostles, I think one of the things that they spent time doing now here were unique men. You know, there have been elders through the years. There were elders in the first century, there still are. There were preachers in the first century, there still are. But the apostles were a unique group, and their work continues through their writing. There never have been more apostles. They're not apostles living on the earth today. So these were very special men. But one of the things that, that we read, we don't read all the apostles' work, do we? We read about a few of the apostles. But you take a fellow like Paul. One of the things he really emphasized was the, the, the humility that we're called to have and that he exemplified in his life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, <coughs> you can't help but think about this when you think about all these chief seats and these um, all of the trappings. Several years ago, I made one visit to Rome in my life, and I was over there, and, and it was when John Paul II was Pope, and he was very gravely ill, and I can remember um, Judd and I talking about this while we were over there, saying, man, I hope that fellow doesn't die while we're here. That's selfish, I know, but man, if he dies, they'll shut this town down. Our, our trip will be done. We won't be able to move. We might even get out of this town. They'll have everybody, every Catholic in the world come down here. Anyway. So he didn't, he spared us a year. But, um, but you know, you look at that fellow, uh, or any pope, and they, uh, they come and they wearing all the trapping and the crown, they're king. That's what the pope is, he's the king of the Catholic Church. Uh, and I don't know why it took me so long to, to really catch up with that. That's what that's really about. And so he wears the robes of a king and the crown of a king. And he comes forward and people bow to him and kiss his feet or kiss his hand because he's the king. And then you think about the apostles, the men that the Lord himself chose to enlighten the whole world with his truth. And this is what Paul said about his work. He said, verse 9, I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake. He said, we're weak. He said, we're despised. He talked about uh, doing without, being reviled, being persecuted, being defamed, being threatened being the off-scouring of the world. What a difference between the apostles of Christ and those who claim to walk in the steps of Peter. But you know, in this context, Paul is gravely concerned that the Corinthians are 
elevating men too much. You remember, that's how he started. Some of you say, I have a Paul of Cephas of Christ. He said, you ought not to elevate men to the place of God. And there's this passage that may seem curious at first, but it really fits exactly into what we're talking about in the, in the, uh, in the, in the third chapter. Look at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. It is written, he takes the wise of their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. And then he adds this, verse 21. He said, therefore let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you're Christ and Christ is God. Instead of bowing down to men, understand that we're servants for one another. God has given you this to bless you and called you at the same time to be a blessing. But stop elevating men, he says. That's a great lesson for all time. But it was something that certainly they would, men would fail at. Men love bureaucracy and they love, it seems as Paul would tell the Corinthians, they, they love to be lorded over. God forbid. But look with me at, uh, at the 20th chapter of Acts. This is a passage we've already read Several times in this study, we'll read it again, and it's familiar to you before I've read it to you. But in Acts 20 and in verse 29 of that meeting with the Ephesian elders at Miletus, Paul writes, For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And I think especially just looking at that history we've just read, we can appreciate the power of that statement. He said, let me tell you, there's an apostasy coming and it's going to start with you all. I don't know that he meant the men, however many there were before him there, but the eldership. This is where it would begin. He said, take heed. Be careful. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw their disciples after them. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice how many times in the New Testament, we're not going to read all of them, but how many times, just along and along, Paul makes this point. There is a storm coming. There's an apostasy coming. You know, here we have the, the apostles of the Lord, and they're the ones in person teaching so many people. Well, there's just no way that they can get this thing off tr track or off the rails. <laughs> you, you underestimate the devil. In 2 Thessalonians Let's see, chapter 2 and verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God that is, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that wicked one shall come. And the Lord will destroy with the breath of his spirit of his mouth. People have wondered through the years, students have wondered about what is Paul talking about here? Is he talking about literally a man, an individual? Is he talking about a particular day or date? I don't know that I have all the answers there, but it occurs to me at least that he's not talking about just one individual. Uh, and I don't think we're still waiting on this to be fulfilled. I think what he's talking about is uh, what he seems to talk about in an individual specific way he talks about otherwise as the mystery of iniquity, a falling away and a strong delusion. The mystery of iniquity. You know, if you look back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, twice in that chapter, Paul talks about another kind of mystery. 
In 3.16, he talks about the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, justified of the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed unto the world, received up to glory. Earlier he had talked about, uh, let's see, the uh, holding the mystery of the faith, verse 9, <clears throat> in a pure conscience. The mystery of the faith represents the truth. It represents God's truth, the saving truth. The mystery of iniquity or lawlessness represents that which is opposed to God's truth. It is the apostasy. It is that which will be brought in and men who don't want the truth would find a way, something else to believe. A strong delusion. A lie that they might believe and be damned because they don't want the truth. Anyway, the point is, this goes right in line with the, with the other warnings that we have the apostles told us that there would be a falling away. He told the Christians of the first century that was true. Look over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. There's the idea. There'll be a departure, an apostasy, a heresy. Heresy simply meaning the idea of making a choice, choosing to leave the path and go your own way. They shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And he goes on to describe something of this apostasy. But he said, it's coming. If you turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In a similar way, Paul writes in the second letter that we have to, from him, himself to Timothy, this admonition, preach the word. Be instant, ready, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to have it. They don't want the mystery of godliness, they want the mystery of iniquity. And they'll follow their own lust. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth, and they'll be turned to fables. Same point, isn't it? Let me read one more among the many we could read. Let me look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter has a lot to say, doesn't it, about trouble from within, the dangers from apostasy within the church, those false teachings brought by brethren. There were false, chapter 2 begins, there were false prophets among the people and there shall be false teachers among you, he says, who shall privily bring in damnable heresies. Again, that word heresy just suggests getting off the path, making a choice, choosing your own way. Where does it lead? Damnation? It's a damnable heresy. He said, they deny the Lord that bought them and they bring on themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways and the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. It's a disaster, he says. Well, so these things that uh, we see starting so small and yet growing and taking people further and further away from the New Testament pattern until ultimately we reach a point where we're bowing down to men and we are discouraging the reading of the Bible. All of these things were predicted to be so. And, and there is in all of this, I think, a lesson for us. And uh, Brother Hall, at the end of this article, uh, offers this thought. He says, every new proposal and every new doctrine must be studied in the light of God's word. We must not allow ourselves to be intimidated by the charges of, quote, legalism, or, quote, book religion, or even traditionalism. The New Testament in its entirety is the doctrine of Christ, and whoever transgresses and does not abide the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. That's, of course, 2 John, verse 9. That's an excellent point. Anyway, back to our, our, the main point here. What about bishops is a New Testament uh, creation. What does the New Testament teach about the Episcopos? 
Well, the word, of course, is foreign to us. It's in a foreign language. But its literal meaning is plain enough, I think. The, the prefix epi oftentimes means upon. And scopos is like our word scope. It means to view, to see. I've never been there, but there is north of Jerusalem a place they call Mount Scopus. You can read about it in some of the histories when Jerusalem was under attack through the years. And from Mount Scopus, you can see the area and you can look down on Jerusalem even. So that's the literal idea of the word. It, it's captured pretty well in the English uh, translation overseer. That's exactly what it is. A superintendent, that is a Christian officer in general charge of a church according to Mr. Strong. Mr. Thayer writes, an overseer, a man charged with the duty of seeing that things to be done by others are done rightly, any curator, guardian, or superintendent, an elder, or an overseer of the Christian church, of a Christian church, I should say, Mr. Thayer. Pierce Bacher writes, it's an inspector, an overseer, a watcher, a guardian. So, uh, Bauer and Gingrich write, overseer, it's used of God, by the way, this word is, as the guardian of our souls. If you flip over, if you're still in, in the writings of Peter, look in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. He's talking about God there as the bishop of our souls. So God is an overseer, a guardian of souls. And now he says, of persons who have a definite function or fixed office within a group, superintendent, a guardian, or a bishop. So that's the idea of an overseer, someone who has charge of, who uh, superintends, someone who uh, is a guardian of, a local church, or of course in the New Testament, always in the plural, the eldership in that way. You know what's strange is <clears throat> that all through the years there have been brethren who have denied the idea that there's any rule connected with episcopos, with uh, the overseers. One fellow, one brother wrote, for some unfortunate vocabulary has inflicted long-term damage to our understanding of spiritual leadership. Words like rule and authority and submit and obey. Those are, by the way, words that are, are connected in our English Bible, all of them, with the eldership and with how we respond to that. But he says that's most unfortunate. Uh, this particular fellow went through uh, many hoops, jumped through many hoops, tried page after page to explain why rule doesn't mean rule and obey doesn't mean obey. Episcopos could be more tra fully translated guides, those who watch out for, those who are concerned on behalf of, or those who care for the church, not those who rule over in rule over it. He adds, biblically speaking, bishop or elder or shepherd is a function and not an office, a task, not a position. We're going to say more about that in just a second about the office, but anyway, just note that point, remark. And let me read one more. He writes, the New Testament does not call for obedience to other Christians simply because he holds an office. Shepherds hold immense influence in our lives. My father held no political, economic, physical, or organizational authority over me, but he lived his life well and walked ahead of me in the Lord and I most assuredly respected and submitted to his suggestions for my life. You know, I thought about that when I read it, and I said, he must have had a different kind of father. I don't remember my dad making a lot of suggestions. He made some, I guess, when I was little. But I remember it being more imperative than suggestions. How about you? Did you ever have a dad who just made a lot of suggestions? Uh, well, it's time for suggestions. And I guess if he's talking to his 30-year-old son, that's a different story. But that's not what we're talking about. Um, I, I think that's, that really gets to the point of it. You know, the question is, does a father have authority over their children? 
Or are they just making suggestions and giving a good example? How about that? Is that an example of when we might have, uh, isn't that parallel in the scriptures? The, the parent with, the, uh, uh, with uh, his uh, role, if he doesn't know how to, to show his leadership in the home, and how will he be able to show it properly in the church? Now, now we're going to say more about this uh, as time permits. Let me be clear. I'm not suggesting there's any place for a dictator. Uh, there's a big difference in a dictatorship and an eldership. We get over to... <clears throat> Um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. We hope to spend more time talking about that very difference between a Lord uh, and uh, one who simply rules over the local flock. But I really find it hard to believe that smart people would go to such lengths to try to suggest that an elder who is called on to rule and rather than to submit really doesn't have any uh, authority or no rule in any sense that we, we would recognize. When you look at this word in the Old Testament, it is used in the Old Testament, Episcopal, uh, in the Greek Old Testament. For example, in Numbers chapter 4 and verse 16, here we have Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, overseer. He was appointed to be the overseer, the oil of the light, the incense of composition, the daily meat offering, and the anointing oil are his charge even the oversight of the whole tabernacle and all things that are in it in the holy place and all the works. I don't believe that for a moment that Eleazar had legislative authority. Do you? I don't believe he could make up the rules as he went. When God has spoken, that's the answer. That's it. But also none of us believes that Eleazar was there just making suggestions and being a good example. I think we understand exactly what it means when it says he was the overseer and these things were in his charge. You know what it means and I do. In 2 Kings chapter 11, another example of this word in the Old Testament. Uh, all the people of the land went into the house of Baal. This is uh, after they got rid of Athaliah. She had made such a mess of things. And they were so glad to get rid of her, Joash. What if the little boy king? They're going to put him up there on the throne. And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and tore it down and completely broke in pieces his altars and his images. And they slew Matthan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed overseers over the house of the Lord. We know what those fellows did. We know what they didn't do. They didn't just make suggestions. Uh, in the book of Job, <clears throat> this would be Zophar's last speech. In uh, in. Job 20, he says, this is the portion of an ungodly man from the Lord and the possession of his goods appointed him by the all-seeing God, the overseeing God, the episkopos God. Well, we certainly understand what that means in reference to God. So there is authority involved in this position, more than just an example, more than just suggestion. And in reference to this idea of there not being an office of a bishop. I, you know, I've heard that all through the years. Um, when I first started preaching, uh, there was a fellow named Charles Holt. A he'd been a preacher a long time. He'd been teaching this doctrine a long time. Somewhere down the line, I suspect, I don't know Brother Holt, don't know his story. I suspect he got crossways with an eldership. And he got bitter about it. And he just decided that he's just going to write elders out of the plan. <laughs> at least as we recognize them. And he wound up writing the New Testament, the local church out of the plan too. I don't know if you ever ran into his teaching or not. Hope not. Anyway, um, his, uh, his view was that, uh, that, that there was no such thing as a local church organization like you think you've got here. He said a church is just people and a local church is just people in a given area. They may choose to meet together. They certainly don't appoint men to lead over them. Elders are just older people in the church. I never could figure out how you could just appoint people to be old. I don't know how that works. But anyway, he had a lot of ideas about that that made sense to him. Didn't make a bit of sense to me. But he persuaded a number of other disgruntled people. By the way, let me just offer this as an aside. Not that it really matters. You, you know, I've been a Christian for a number of years. Not, not as long as some of you guys, but longer than others. And I have dealt with elders. And I have had some great dealings with elders. And I have had some not great dealings with elders. Some really scarring. 
But you cannot allow such things to make you bitter about the office. Can't do that. I can't either. And I think that's happened to some men through the years uh, who really are bright enough to know better than what they're teaching, but they're emotionally invested in this matter. There's no office of an elder. You might have thought immediately, well, the guy, you ever read 1 Timothy 3 1? Doesn't that settle it? <laughs> uh, if a man is a true saint, if a man desires the office of bishop, he desires a good work. There it is. You can't say it's not an office. It's right there. Well, I'll tell you what these fellows will say. They'll say it may look like it's there, but it's not there in the original. Uh, and there's some truth to what they, they would say about that. This is too small, and we don't know what Greek is anyway. But, you know, in, in the original language here, let's see, the... Uh, the, the idea of office of a bishop really all comes from this one word. There's not a separate word for office, in other words, there. Um, true word, uh, if any desire, that's one word. There's actually two words for desire. It's desires in, in both places in, in my translation, desire, desire. But two different words. This is a word that means to stretch forward for something. This is the word uh, epithumia, which means to, 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 uh, to have your desire upon, your, your, your uh, uh, passion for something. So he says, this is a true word, if any, uh, and then here's this word, uh, desires uh, this office. He desires a good work. He desires something good. But the word here is, is one word, and uh, that is... Uh, uh, See if I can go back and see it here. Epicopes. So it's, it's very close to, to what we looked at earlier. But it's the genitive form of the word. The point is that when you look at this particular word, uh, here's a, an interlinear. This is uh, just looking at the word as it might be literally translated. He translates it here, overseership. That idea of overseership is another way of saying the office of an elder. That's why in your translation, likely, it says office, not just the King James, but the American Standard Version, the English Standard Version, office of an overseer. Even the modern speech translations, by and large, the position of a bishop. Uh, CEV always takes some liberties, but it talks about church official. Here's an official position of being an elder. This is a bishop. This is an office. It's not an unofficial matter. It's not a coincidental thing. This is a position. Now, I know when brethren fight against that, I know what they're fighting against, this idea of dictatorship and arbitrariness and orderliness and pride, and nobody's for that. But I don't think any of us can scripturally deny that being an elder, a bishop, is an office. It's an official place that God has given, that a man is appointed to. Um, uh, time's up, so what should I do? Place, position, episcope. It's used twice in the visitation of God, in Luke and in 1 Peter, both as a judge and as a deliverer. It's used of Judas. You remember in Acts chapter 1 and verse 20? Uh, when they're gathered together and part of what they're going to do is they're going to choose uh, someone to replace Judas. It winds up being Matthias. For it is written, Peter said, in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric, is that another take? That's our word. It's the idea of the office of, a, the office of overseer. In this case, he's talking not about an elder but about an apostle. So, my point is, this word suggests formality. It's no less formal than being an apostle. It wasn't just casual. It wasn't just happenstance. And not only that, but men were ordained to this work. And I think we'll pause there because I want to say some more things about this idea of ordination. But uh, anyway, I appreciate your kind attention. I hope that these thoughts have been useful to you. And as always, uh, I realize most of this is very basic stuff, but if I say something that does raise a question in your mind or you question what I mean by something I say, please feel free to talk with me about that. 
and I'd be very glad to entertain your questions. Get your songbooks out if you haven't already and turn to the number that's been selected. And if you're here this evening and uh, you're not a child of God, why not tonight make the choice to become a Christian, follow Jesus in the way that he's authorized, the only way we can. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If you haven't done that, why not tonight? If you're a child of God, we've strayed from the Lord, return to him. He longs to receive you. Let us know how we might be able to help you even right now while we stand and sing. We